accessing library computer data. Out there, there are no saints, just people. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. We are continuing our run-through of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and right now we're up to the episode called Civil Defense. It is the seventh episode of the third season, aired on the 7th of November, 1994, written by Mike Crone, directed by Reza Badi. I think that's how you pronounce it. Apologies if I didn't get it right. In this episode, Cisco, Jake, and O'Brien accidentally trigger an old Cardassian security system that believes the occupation is still going on, and the station has been taken in a Bajoran workers' rebellion. We're joined by Brad. Brad, welcome back to the show. How are you? Hey, Wes. Thanks for having me. I'm good. How are you? Good. Good. Um... We're talking about two episodes today. We're only going to be talking about this one on this episode itself. But uh, I had not seen this one in a very, very long time. And it's interesting. You had responded saying that you liked this one quite a bit. So I think we'll have something to talk about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Civil Defense is uh, an interesting episode that I'm probably going to lead off with a patron comment when we come back. But I'm going to play an audio clip. Me and Brad are going to come back and we're going to break down Civil Defense. You should evacuate the area immediately. Habitat ring. There have to be hundreds of people trapped in their quarters out there. I believe that's the point, Major. Computer, access code Garrick 1359. Ironic, isn't it? The only place in the galaxy that still recognizes my access code is a Bajoran space station. If you can get past the force fields, you've got to get out to the habitat ring and start evacuating those people before- I'd like nothing better than to help my loyal customers. But it's not that simple. My access code enables me to move about the station. But unfortunately, as you've just seen, the force fields reappear the moment I pass through a doorway. Have you tried using your code to shut down the security program? Oh, several times, but for some reason I can't begin to fathom. Guldicott chose not to trust me with his top-level security codes during the occupation. All right, so let's get into this one. Um, I'm going to start it off with a patron comment. Normally we read these at the end, but I think that this one's important for how it uh, starts off my process of thinking about this one. Kyle Barrett says, Civil Defense, a great episode that probably should have happened in the first season considering Starfleet have lived on the station for three years at this point and have not tripped the security procedures until now. Uh, Kyle has more to say, but I'll leave that at this point. So uh, I'm I'm going to start this one, Brad, before I throw it to you by saying what I like about this episode. I think the main thing that it actually accomplishes is that it reminds you of what the point and the origin of DS9 is in a way that the, looking back on it, I think the show is actually fairly bad at doing. Um, I feel like the series pays a lot of lip service to the origin of things. And you have occasional episodes like Necessary Evil uh, that sort of remind you what that there was a prior history to everything going on here. But I was I was a little bit surprised by how weird and interesting it is to see the station be explored as a mining facility that had a slave labor at like the heart of it um and you don't really get that sense like when you spend a lot of time on the promenade and everything looks weird but it's all shop and very you know utopian and very there's very nice and you don't really get a sense of the purpose here and i think i remember clay being surprised in an episode that the facility was used for mining because you don't really get that um impression unless someone says it in an episode that you miss but uh what do you think well and you said you like this episode so why don't you uh lead off with something yeah i actually i think you made some really good points uh it's not obvious in fact i remember being totally surprised and uh taken back when i when i realized uh later on that that giant sort of bulb at the bottom of the station is for mining. It's it's a giant you know laser that they were using to uh, to mine materials down on Bajor. And I, that was just never really explained. There's so much about the station that makes sense if you think about it in terms of its function back during the occupation, but it's not really. It's kind of like teased out over several seasons and kind of uh, throwaway lines. So yeah, this this episode definitely helped bring that back into focus, and I agree with the commenter that it probably it feels a lot like a first season episode it's much better than a first season episode would have been but it's the the content matter seems like it should be 
uh, first or second season. I'm I'm not sorry that they did it in the third season. It just seems a little out of place. Um, I guess the thing I loved about it, <clears throat> I think this episode, just to be clear, I think this episode is ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> when it comes to the actual plot and the, you know, the realistic nature of whether or not this could actually happen, I think is totally off the wall bonkers. I, I don't believe that this series of events would have been possible um, three years into the Federation having occupied the station. So I, I kind of, I, when I suspend my disbelief and just have fun with the premise, I think it's an awesome episode with some really great moments. And it's it's so uh, it, it it's so quirky and and bonkers that it it becomes really fun. But if you start to 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 look at it as a realistic episode and tear it apart, it it falls apart almost immediately. Yeah, I think I think that's going to be my problem with it. And to to further flesh out Kyle's point, if if this had been a first season episode, it's definitely top three possibly top two depending on what you think the number two episode is for the first season i think um it makes a lot more sense in the first season i think it would have been a great station identity building episode like you said like Mm -hmm. you never really get a sense of the thing mining you get you understand that a lot of ships approach ds9 but you you don't understand that they would have been approaching it to get the ore or whatever that they were Mm -hmm. refining from it so you you get this false sense of what the station is, and besides the fact that it's Cardassian, and it would have, it would have aided. O'Brien spent a good deal of the first and second season constantly complaining about the state of the station, right? And mm-hmm. to me, the reason that he's w- would have been complaining is because Starfleet should be trying to uh, rig this thing to do something that it was not designed to do, right? It's not designed to be this sort of. Uh, hub of activity space station it's it's really an old junky dirty mining sure. station and you don't really get that impression which is funny like they don't ever get that across you get the sense more that o'brien's having difficulty because he's not good at coding cardassian software <laughs> more than anything mm-hmm. um yeah. and i feel it should be more physical than that and tying it into the um you know going into the, the first season i think would have been better served by having an episode like this and showing you the real alien nature of it um, and then going from there. But once you once you get back from that point, as you were saying, the episode is pretty ridiculous uh, on a plot level. I I was really distracted by the fact that every time Ducat appears on a recorded message, I was thinking, is this like a Bethesda Fallout game? Like, how many lines of dialogue did <laughs> Ducat have to record for every single contingency? Because he he refers to each thing that they do to yes. try to get around it as like, ah, 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 you shouldn't be doing that. Um, so yeah, well, what what particularly yeah. did you think about? The, why do you think the plot is ridiculous? But you're managing. That's to, what uh, I loved it? about it. That is what I I absolutely loved about it. Is I thought about him sitting in his office, recording, like, you know, mapping out all the different possible scenarios of a prisoner revolt, and then recording, you know, these little charismatic messages of him. You know, he even goes to great lengths to, uh, when he releases the gas on the, uh, on the workers, um, on the mining facility, he, he, you know, he, he looks in the camera and says, I'm so sorry that it had to end this way, but you know, yeah, right. <laughs> he's got some rehearsed speech for every situation. And I just, I loved thinking about him sitting there programming this. Yeah. It, it's so ridiculous over the top, but also Ducat is, uh, we, we know Ducat is completely arrogant. He's completely self-absorbed. He's completely, um, uh, paranoid. And he's a Cardassian, which means that he's always, you know, looking for threats around every corner. And so it actually kind of almost makes sense in universe that he would do something this ridiculous. I I guess I didn't. While I I recognize this whole thing's nuts, I kind of think Ducat's equally nuts. And so I think those two things actually work out, sort of. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it it, it totally fits into the. We've mentioned before the Cardassians are big fans of the uh, the long haul con. Like yeah. they're willing to go for a very long distances con. This fits in, uh, as you were saying. I, I feel that fits their identity here. I was a little bit. I, I was always distracted by the fact of like, do the Cardassians accomplish anything else while they're scheming about things? Like, how do they get <laughs> anything done? And then the the other thing is that I felt it was all fine until the very final escalation is that he's like, I'm going to blow up the station. 
which I don't feel is realistic for what the Cardassians would have done in that situation. Um, the gassing makes sense, and maybe even killing your own troops and your own soldiers who are on DS9 at that point, that makes sense to me. But I feel, since the whole point of being, of having that station on Bajor is to serve its purpose to, like, strip the planet of stuff, blowing it up mm-hmm. doesn't make much sense to me from a Cardassian point of view. It, it almost feels like more of a Klingon perspective would do that. Um, and I was kind of the, the that, that's really just the the in-universe stuff. And then, you know, additional sort of weird quirkiness I have with the plot is Dukat just kind of showing up there uh, with no problem. Um, I feel like Garrick and him have a really great interaction with each other, but it doesn't make a lot of sense in context of what they're seeing. Um, And then the, just the, the sort of, the sort of, I, I was a little bit disappointed with just the nature of, I expected more of a disaster TNG episode. You know what I mean? Mm. Like I expected more of a, a whole bunch of people are in different situations and we jump between them trying to figure out how to get out of the situation. And in, in reality, there's only two groups in this episode. There's the Cisco group and then there's the Kira group and the ops. Um, yeah. The Quark and Odo group kind of just bicker with each other and uh, don't actually solve any problems. Right, and and you know it, it works yeah. out that they need each other to solve the problem at the very end. But yeah. I was a little disappointed that they didn't they didn't have a little bit more of a, a back and forth type thing, which would have allowed you more of the um, Odo Quark just on their own stuff, which they fall back on all the time. But uh, yeah. what would you think of the character stuff? Yeah, I think the character stuff was good. I uh, <laughs> I I thought it was funny how they really worked hard to throw Quark and Odo together. Uh, as soon as possible in all these episodes, and they, they're not even really trying to disguise it anymore. They just need Quark and Odo to be together, trapped. Anytime there's someone's going to be trapped in a room with Odo, it's uh, if it's not Luxana Troy, it's got to be it's got to be Quark. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. I thought it was funny how fast that that happened, and I kind of rolled my eyes a little bit. Um, but at this point, I've just accepted that that's part of DS9 and and how how they roll. Having said that, I didn't really think that the Quark and Odo scenes were that great in this episode. I thought they're their dialogue was pretty bland. And I thought it was kind of out of character for Odo to praise Quark. Yeah, immediately. Uh, even if they thought even if they thought they were going to die uh, in other episodes, uh Odo totally withholds any praise from Quark even though he does have sort of a begrudging respect from for Quark. He he's goes out of his way to never let Quark know that. And I I feel like that kind of betrayed um their dynamic a little bit in this episode seemed weird. They they try to flip it a little bit at the end and have Odo say he didn't have anything else to say, but I, I think the problem with it is that Odo says it almost immediately in the episode. Yeah. Like, as soon as the force field goes up, he's like, you know what, Quark, you are the most devious Ferengi that I've ever uh, encountered, and <laughs> yeah. I owe you that. But the, the, I feel the same about um the Gar- uh, Garrick and Dukat interaction. The, the one mm. where... Dukat is talking to Kira and Garrick is like, hey, she's not going to sleep with you. So just, so just knock it off. I, that's a very <laughs> weird interaction to me. That It, it, it feels, was. I didn't even yeah. get the impression that that's what he was doing in the first place. Dukat was doing. But I, I guess it makes sense. And they obviously, they flesh this out later on and they build off of it. Yeah. But it feels out of the blue, out of the blue where it comes up in this episode. It was out of the blue, but I'll tell you, I, I actually, that's one of my favorite parts of the episode. Actually, just the entire I felt like the episode was a solid, you know, average episode of disaster Star Trek in the, and I, you know, I was okay with it, but I wasn't really excited about this whole premise until, until the moment when the replicator creates this drone that starts firing randomly at everybody in ops, everybody's pinned down and can't move. And then Dukat shows up and just struts around in front of this drone while it's firing all over, at, you know, at everyone except him, firing around him carefully. And he just struts around like a, a, a complete mustache twirling villain asking if they're having trouble. Yeah. And it's totally over the top and it's totally ridiculous. But I, for me, that's when, for one, that's when the episode just got great. <laughs> I, as far as just being a cheesy ultimately really funny and enjoyable episode that's when it really turned the corner to being uh good for me and i loved all the interactions he had with garrick 
I loved when Garrett comes back and says, "Hey, she's not going to sleep with you." That was totally out of the out of the blue. You're right, but it, the look on Mark Limo's face when he he's just it's like one of the few times you ever see Ducat flabbergasted when he's like, "Well, I, that's not what I was." Garrick, you yes, know? and it's clear, uh, <laughs> that Garrick, it's clear that Garrick is correct about what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it totally saves any awkwardness that might have come out of that line by Ducat confirms it with his face, like, "Well, you know, shut up," you know, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Insulting him by calling him a uh, Taylor over and over again. Taylor, yeah. I just, I just felt like I embraced the cheesy turn of Ducat showing up because I agree with you that doesn't make any sense. Um, but I loved it. I, I just, I've, I've chosen to embrace this episode as just a campy, cheesy, uh, romp. And for me, it, what really sealed the deal for me with Ducat, all the Ducat stuff was one, he tries to strut back to his ship to, to give Kira time to think about his, uh, ultimatum. And the program has a program within it written by his superior, to prevent him from leaving in, t- in case of a crisis. That and that was, just felt... That, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt, but that is no, the most, that's the most brilliant moment in that entire episode, I think. Um, yeah. It's almost a... It's almost an unbelievable twist, but I take it more as like a meta commentary on the Cardassians yeah. than anything. Like, yeah. his yeah. superior had thought that just in case all of Ducat's Bethesda fallout lines don't come in, <laughs> uh, like work around and he tries to escape, I'm going to have my thing here, which exposes him. And it's a, it's a totally brilliant twist on the story to that point where the Cardassians are so paranoid about what's going to go on that they will build in a safety protocol because they expect that their commanding officer is going to leave the situation. <laughs> um, really genius. And it's, it's almost legitimately funny. Marco Lambo just kind of hold what it, it ends on. A, it's a button of a scene. So it like ends and it cuts to commercial and Marco Lambo just kind of like holds his hands up like, well, the fuck am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I remember laughing at this and, but not in a way that, you know, it is, it's it's hard because it simultaneously is ridiculous on its face if you think about it. But like you said, it it is a sort of a meta commentary, and if you take it that way and you just roll with it, it it it's commenting on how paranoid the Cardassians are, how untrusting they are, even of their own, and how devious and you know long conny they can be. That his superior found out that he created this program and decided to edit it just to make sure that it ended the way that he wanted, right. assuming. <laughs> That Mark Lamo's character would just would probably try to uh, take the coward's way out, and that that was somehow a program within a program, a virus within a virus. <laughs> it's these guys really are just tying themselves into knots to stab each other in the back, and I, it's great. I, I ultimately I have to admit that I love it. It's, yeah, it's <laughs> it's a I, I that was my favorite. That's my favorite part of the whole exercise. I like the. I like the general plot. I mean, it kind of resolves itself in a very stereotypical Star Trek, like we got to get to this reactor core of glowing mm-hmm. tubes and turn them around. I like how um, Cisco, when he's fixing the reactor core, he ta- he's taking out this chip and spinning it around, but he looks at each and every one of them as if he's doing something unique. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but he's really just, he's doing that. O'Brien takes a sparkler to the face and goes down <laughs> um, pretty quickly. Sparkler, yeah. It's a... It's an episode that I think suffered a little bit. I, I, I'm always willing to give it the benefit of a doubt because they don't have huge budgets, but I feel like the budget here was a little bit of a letdown in the explosion department. All the explosions are pretty oh, sure. yeah. inconsequential and they do more damage than you'd expect when they, um, when they blow open the hatch, it's like a sparkler gets lit up and there's a hole in the wall. And then yeah, O'Brien he's like, gets well, be careful up. or are we going to bring down the whole room? And then right. there's just like this little... <laughs> M80 goes off. <laughs> yeah, basically, basically. And, um, yeah. you know, the, 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 I feel the, the kind of the problem with it, I guess it, in your sense, if you just absorb it as kind of like a campy, goofy, silly episode, I was left thinking that maybe DS9 at this point kind of needs a character story to be mixed in there. And it felt like it was a prime Jake story to get mixed in. And instead all of Jake's scenes come across as the very cliche father, son in a difficult situation set up. Like there's, mm-hmm. you know, Cisco will be like, Jake, you need to go back. And Jake says, I'm coming with you. And there's not even really a hesitation. And 
Commander Sisko is just like, okay, you're coming with me. And then, then they <laughs> that, go off. That was very fast. Yeah. It's, did, did you like who, if you, if you were to make this a character episode, would you pin it on anybody? Or do you think that it's just, it doesn't need it at this point? Uh, I think you're right that they could have done something with Jake here. Maybe he could be a hero in some way, grow a little bit, something. Um, I kind of don't like that personally, just because I don't like the character of Jake and wish he would kind of go away, but yep. that's <laughs> just me. Um, yeah, I don't know who you would really focus on. Um, to me, this was more about, uh, I don't know. What was this episode about? I would have a hard time figuring out how to jam a character story into this just because it's so campy and over the top that I think if you try to put anything serious in here, it, the tones would just kind of be clashing. Yeah. I, yeah. To me, the only thing that makes sense about this episode is that it's just, um, it's just bonkers, and it embraces bonkers throughout the entire episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. I mean, I don't. It, it's tough whenever you um, whenever you start watching them. I feel like I I always I always kind of have to watch them twice because I feel like sometimes if you go into the episode with the wrong attitude about what you're expecting from it, you don't view it properly. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this one is kind of that situation. I, I don't think this is an episode that I really love or that I really think is terrible. It, it kind of falls in the middle. It fits. It felt very much like disaster to me, as I mentioned before. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. and it, on that sense, I was more impressed with it than disaster because the core of how they got to this story makes more sense in the DS nine universe than in, in TNG, they just run into some invisible space thing and it causes them to crash. Um, right. This feels I think if you were going to build a story off of this one, Kira and Dukat's relationship would probably be the forefront. And they have a scene together, which is mm -hmm. interesting and maybe one of the better scenes, uh, right down to the direction of uh, Dukat flicks the baseball off of Cisco's desk. Yeah, um, I would have built it there, and I think that it's just a the that relationship hasn't really been explored outside of the fact that they don't like each other. Um, and obviously it'll, it expands much more from there, but I, I feel like this was a kind of a space to set that up. They kind of set it up with Garrick's weird line about having wanting to have sex with her. But, mm -hmm. um, and the, the one thing I wanted to talk about Garrick with you, Clay had mentioned earlier, um, he was worried having never seen the series. He's worried about Garrick's uh, tendency to be a crutch for writing mm -hmm. on some level. I really felt it in this episode, actually, and I don't know if I'm hypersensitive because he brought it up, so now I'm looking for it, but Garrick is a shortcut for the writers to solve Cardassian problems very easily. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you thought that was a problem or if you think I, that there's any kind of you know, expansion it, on that. It's funny you mention that because I remember Clay saying that, and when he brought that up, I thought, oh, you know, that's actually a really good point. That he is kind of a get-it-out-of-jail-free card any time they have generic Cardassian security problem. They just kind of pull him in. I actually felt like I thought about it during this episode. That was in the back of my head. And I remembered it differently. I remembered him being that get out of jail free card that came in and kind of saved the day. But that's totally actually not what happens. He he has some limited access that lets him move around the station and he, he comes up with ideas on what to do. But actually, I don't think he actually does anything that makes anything better. In fact, no. I think he's the reason that the self-destruct triggers is because he has some idea that doesn't pan out uh and in the end i liked that they gave him that they acknowledged that he would have had some access because it would feel weird to sit to basically make him helpless but but they didn't give him ultimate authority i like that line about how for some reason that i can't begin to fathom you know ducat didn't trust me with the highest level access to the occupation. yeah and so he actually they actually uh, i felt like they did an okay job of like uh making sure that his power had limits here and he couldn't just go hit the red button and turn everything off. You know? Yeah. His, his function is basically to explain the situation. Like mm -hmm. they kind of figure out what it is, but he appears as the first person to get into ops after the force fields go up and they show you that, um, he sort of establishes the fact that it is not a, just a crazed computer program. Like it, it can be worked around. Like there mm -hmm. are access codes for him to be able to get in and stuff, but you're right. After he does that, he kind of just sits around and argues with Dukat as opposed to actually accomplishing right. anything. So he's not he's not totally a crutch, but I think he he's a crutch in the sense that he exists in order to explain situations to people in this episode. Sure, yeah. He's definitely definitely um, used for exposition here. Yep. 
and I, I I like the fact that they um Bashir mentions that he uh, had some or Garrick mentions he has uh, some pants that Bashir had brought to be hemmed <laughs> or something. Um, I know that I know his role as a tailor, and I've never really thought about it. But wouldn't you just replicate new pants that fit better? <laughs> like, what? I his uh, his job is a little bit odd. Maybe it's just kind of a uh, hipster sort of like it's very. I was thinking that that same word. Yeah, I think there's probably a cachet that goes along with doing it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. I think if every Joe Schmo's got replicated jeans, and you've got some carefully rethreaded, um, you know. Uh, jeans with with occasional holes in them and things that's it tells your personal story man yeah yeah i mean <laughs> i was just thinking on it's like the age we live in with the internet um clothes shopping is the one thing that i'm still pretty hesitant to do online um just because i feel like 90 percent of the clothes i order don't fit properly sure. um and I, I know that like if you're if you listen to like uh men's style advice it's like every bit of clothing has to be tailored obviously you have to bring every pair of pants in to get it fit you properly but i don't have the time or the money or wherewithal to actually do that so i'm i'm stuck in this uh this era of ordering clothes and then shipping them back because they don't fit and either trying again or not trying again it's very frustrating garrick exists in the future i imagine in the same kind of situation yeah you know not every problem can be solved in the future no, <laughs> pants that's, continue to be that's a, what DS9 is all about, examining that utopia stress. and exposing the cracks in it, right? <laughs> um, exactly. Let's see, did you have anything else to say about this episode? I think we've we covered all the plot points. I don't know if, there, as, you, as you say, there's no real character. There's yeah. no real character beats beyond the Jake stuff, which I thought was okay. The Quirk and Odo is okay, but it's just kind of a repetition of what we've seen with those characters before. Um, Kieran Ducat, we talked about Garrick being there. I what do you think of the direction of this episode? Did you notice anything about it? I thought it was bad, and I was like, "Who had directed this?" And apparently, as someone who comes back, Andy's a pretty strong veteran of TV. Um, I don't want to mispronounce his name again, but if you if you want to look up his name, um, he comes back and he directs a lot more DS Nine. Hopefully, he improves. I couldn't tell. I I got a sense of a lot of um. There's a lot of shots of like people running dramatically up to banisters. And stuff like that really stuck out at me. Mm. It was very awkward, and okay. I, I don't know. Did you notice anything about it? You know, I'll admit I'm I don't really have a keen eye for direction. Um, unless something is really bizarre, I usually don't notice. So, uh, uh, to me, it was fine. But I'll take your word for it. I think you, I'm, you know, I'm but, that way on um music. I don't notice music unless it's like either amazingly good or amazingly bad. Uh, mm-hmm. I will, I'll have more to say about this in the next episode, but it, it's probably the same. I just I never notice music in things unless it's someone either points it out to me or I'm like, oh, I really like that or I hate that. Oh, interesting. Yeah, the, the director's name was uh, Reza. I think it's Badiyi. Yes. Yep. Yep. That's right. So uh, Reza returns. And Reza's pretty old, I think, at this point. He's not a... Uh, <laughs> when he was recording this, he's obviously... He's a veteran of TV. I know that he's directed a whole bunch of TV. But I was just, I, I just thought it was odd. Maybe it's the sense of a person coming in and being new to a series or something. But uh, yeah. the only other... Does the does the the Jeffries 2 being on fire at the end strike you as odd? Or was that a, oh, just the, the final escalation that they had to crawl through the hellfire yeah. to get to Serenity or whatever? That felt like just... Um, how do we turn up the stakes here at the end? How do we ratchet up the the drama before the final conclusion? It, it felt kind of odd. Nothing I, else like is the, on fire. Nothing else yeah. is on fire except that tube <laughs> that they have to crawl through. The, I felt like the green sort of plasma fire was sort of reminiscent of uh, Disaster, the TNG episode. I don't sure. know if they intended yep. that at all, but it, it, it clicked in my head at least. Well, I, I like the, you know, it's a total Star Trek explanation. They're like, we'll, we'll shoot the explosion out as electricity into the shields. And that struck me as very disaster when Data gets electrocuted. It was that kind of special effect. Where the, oh, that, yeah. That, I don't know if that special, I don't know if that rationale makes a lot of sense that you can just shoot the energy of an explosion somewhere else. But that's what they do, and that's how they get through it. Yeah, it doesn't, most of the let's monkey around with the station stuff looked really bad. That's the one comment that I have on this episode. You know, it's mostly just people shoving their hands into computers yeah, and yeah. moving their hands around. Or worse is when they actually show you what they're doing and they're just pulling out these rods, holding them up to the light for some reason. I don't know if that means they can just figure out, you know, which file they want or something by yeah, holding up yeah. the light and then plugging it into a different hole. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
I or tapping furiously at a panel. You know, it just a lot of this episode was consumed with this really just hammy. Like, there's no reason that that should control anything. Uh, Dex yeah. Dex is fiddling and gets her hands like burnt or something. Yeah, uh, I found that to be weird. What was the point of having her hands get burnt? It didn't, it, it didn't impact. It, it, they have scenes with her after that, right? And she's totally fine. It, it's not like she was the key cog. I guess they rely on um, Ducat because Ducat is the one who fixes the whatever he does with the sensors or whatever his like solution is at the very end. He's the one that's working on it, and not Dax. So maybe that was supposed to accomplish that. I I guess yeah. It, it was just a bunch of people. It reminds me of that episode. I forget which one it was. I think where where oh, it's the one where everyone gets drunk. Like one of the very first TNG episodes. Yep, and naked they now pull out time. all those ice linear chips, and they're just sitting on the on the floor. And then Data has to, you know, quickly put them all back in order somehow. Yep. <laughs> apparently yep. the uh, apparently all computers run on these uh, like you know tape drives that you have to plug <laughs> in in the right order in the uh, in the future. That's how everything works. And you you think with the amount of shaking the ships take that those would just rattle loose after time, and you'd have to right. be like oh constantly pushing them in. But yeah, it's um. It's funny the things that they got right and the things that they got clearly wrong. And it looks like the isolinear chip is not going to be the wave of the future, I don't think. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe yeah, they're developing no, that right I, now. I totally, yeah, the Nintendo cartridges that you plug into the ship aren't, aren't quite the technology that we're, <laughs> that we're rolling. I mean, yeah. the big oversight in the technology is that they don't have an internet, right? That's the, that's the one thing that's like kind sure. of remarkable. Although, the amount of times I notice it is very low, interestingly. It's, it's almost, it's not even like a... When you're watching an old movie and you're like, oh, if they had cell phones, everything would be fixed. I don't, I don't even think about it on that level. I think they get away with it because a lot of times we're either, you know, the Enterprise or, or on a station that's remote. And so you think, oh, well, you know, on a cruise ship, I probably wouldn't have internet access. Or, you know, it's, they're, they're kind of away from the hub of civilization. But anytime they're on a planet, I, I think there should be some kind of... Uh, and they're struggling to figure something out and they call the enterprise computer or something to tell them. I'm yeah. like, why, why aren't you just, why don't you just look it up? Right. Exactly. Yeah. I guess the, I guess the implication is that the computer is so sophisticated. It basically holds all the internet, all the knowledge that the internet would hold in the first place. So it's, it, it it's, it's just funny that they never, they always have to wait on like results to be sent over. They never have instant access to other stuff that's going on elsewhere. Um, yeah. let's see here. I think I'm pretty much done with this. I think that was all I had as well. Um, yeah, that's, that's yeah. pretty much it. I, we'll take a break. We'll play an audio clip. We'll come back and we will uh, read some patron thoughts. And then me and Brad will give our final thoughts and we'll call it a day for this one. Ducat, one to transport, energize. Energize. Ducat. If you are seeing this recording, it means you tried to abandon your post while the station's self-destruct sequence was engaged. That will this not be is permitted. Outrageous. You have lost control of Terra Knorr, disgracing yourself and Cardassia. Your attempt to escape is no doubt a final act of cowardice. All fail-safes have been eliminated. Your personal access codes have been rescinded. The destruct sequence can no longer be halted. All you can do now is contemplate the depth of your disgrace and try to die like a Cardassian. All right, everybody. So if you're familiar or you're unfamiliar, you can go to patreon.com slash file. If you want to support the show, you get to leave comments about upcoming episodes and we read them and react to them on the podcast. I had gone through and highlighted all of these earlier and now the highlights are gone. So you're going to have to be a little bit uh, forgiving here. So, Zam Nuclear Wessel writes, Civil Defense, one of my favorite episodes. The structure, as each attempt just escalates the problem, is perfect. I just wish it had come before crossover so someone would have thought of having Intendant Kira say, Attention Terran Workers. That's a good, <laughs> it's a, it's a good point. I mean, the, this is the other example of an episode that I um, would pair with Necessary Evil, even though it doesn't take place in our universe. Seeing the Mirror Universe is kind of an insight into how the station used to be run under the Cardassians. Do you imagine it being very similar? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think it, it goes with the theme of having an authoritarian government and, and having, uh, and they're actually mining base. in the, yeah, the area. And, and like they're doing mining. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see here. Stephen Cobb says civil defense. Love this episode. It has great pacing. Gold to cut, choose the scenery and the A and B stories intermingle very well. 
Quirk and Odo are a bit cheesy towards the end, but start off strong. I love the idea of the automated defense program, its escalating steps, and that Central Command would add their own layer, trapping Dukat, makes the Cardassians feel very bureaucratic. This episode serves as a nice reminder that Cardassians used to run the station and enslave the Bajorans. Kira's admonishment of Bashir regarding the station being home is kind of what this episode is doing for the show. Um, th- that's pretty much my entire, uh, yeah, what I think. So I, I agree with Steven 100%. Uh, do, 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 civil. Christian Posh. I, I, Christian, I apologize. Some, some people's last names are just escaped me for how to pronounce, but it's Christian. DS9's version of TNG's Disaster. I like Disaster, but I like Civil Defense even better. Great job of splitting up the cast in a way that works. It might not be the most revolutionary groupings. Quirk and Odo is rather obvious, but it still works. Dukat coming aboard, gloating, and then getting trapped and verbally sparring with Garrick is fantastic. The idea of a security program like this fits the Cardassians very well. I feel like everyone is kind of on the same page with this episode, which is mm-hmm. interesting. Um, that's... A little, do you think why do you think that is Brad why would everyone I've, come away with the same takeaways I feel like anytime you get Garrick and Dukat in a room bickering with each other and then you add on top of that a layer of Dukat gloating and then getting uh, having to eat crow immediately um, the, those, those are two things that I think most DS9 fans just love I think this just works uh, it, I think it's hard to be upset with with those things in play. I think if you take Dukat and Garrick and, and that whole uh, layer out of the episode, and if it's just them fighting the computer the whole time, then it really does just become disaster. And yeah. it becomes yeah. just kind of a, an okay, you know, problem solving, Federation problem solving episode. Um, I think the Garrick Dukat villainy stuff is really what drives this into the hearts of people that love DS9. Yeah, that's that's probably a good thing. So maybe I'm off with the character work, and I'm just underestimating the Cardassian character work. It, maybe it's not character work, but it's in it's inserting their personalities into the story to differentiate it a little bit. And I think you're right about that because if you remove them, you have TNG. Um, yeah, and TNG is reliant on a you know no particular person. Just a force of nature causes a disaster, and this is how we work through it. Or DS9 is much more of a interpersonal conflict even if it's between species uh civil defense from matthew ross an interesting concept that tries to be cute to uh to the end where it has additional false pressure of what countdown to zero several times the calm nonchalant walking of the extras in the background betrays the whole premise knowing that it'll all be okay the acting is reliable (laughs) o'brien suffers jake whines and so does quark kira and odo are dependably stoic dax talks the techno babble without referencing tobin or curzon Bashir is like the kid who thinks he knows something. The bickering between Dukat and Garrick is humorous. Cisco's, gets to, Cisco's get to it, no nonsense approach saves the day. Dukat's plan to take over is an unrealistic bordering on the idiotic and clearly set to fail. All I can say is that the replicator shooting you is a great dieting technique. It's nice to know that although there's six minutes until boom, Cisco, O'Brien, and Jake are able to mosey in the right direction. No, ru- everyone, no one runs in Star Trek. That's just the way it works. Um, there's no rush. They have long-term contracts. And after they've solved everything... You would think that there would be signs of panic on the promenade, but nope, business as usual. Another day, another self-destruct aboard it. Um, (laughs) I think, I sort of agree, I, as far as, like, the background stuff, I really only remember the fact that they, Sisko and Bashir, uh, Sisko and O'Brien and Jake are in the mining sets that we've never seen before. Uh, That's really, like, the background. I actually didn't even notice the promenade sets, I don't think. Yeah, I think what he may be referring to, which cracked me up a lot, is in Ops, there were some Bajoran workers that were just kind of faffing about, and when Kira turns to shoot the, uh, the life door. support, uh, the life support system, which apparently is how you turn off life support, and you <laughs> shoot the panel, there's just two dudes that are kind of sitting there, and they, they're just kind of, I don't know, shooting the shit with each other. They look totally relaxed. Yeah. And then <laughs> they look over at Kira pointing a pistol like, oh, they, <laughs> they run away. It was it was pretty comical that they were just having lunch or something. Until yeah, time. yeah. It's uh, extras who didn't bother to uh, read the script. They're just happy to happy to be there. Uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do civil defense. There we go. Andrew Kerlog. I think I looked it up and that's how you pronounce it. Andrew Kerlog says, Civil defense, an episode that reminds you of how brutal the Cardassians are. The entire idea that a station full of people would be killed to keep a few Bajorans from escaping the processing facility is terrifying. It becomes clear just how terrifying even uh, when even Dukat does not know exactly how deep the program goes. 
The episode as a whole is average, but the larger, larger point about how brutal the Cardassians are is a fitting reminder that only a few episodes before the Obsidian Order tried to commit genocide. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. I 100% agree, I think. It's true. Uh, it's, yep. a, it's a good Cardassian um, episode in the sense that you understand what they where they're coming mm-hmm. from and everything, and I like the bureaucracy aspect to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kyle Barrett says, Civil Defense, a great episode that probably should have happened in the first season, considering Starfleet have lived on the station for three years at this point and not tripped the procedures until now, security procedures until now. That's just a nitpick, though. The episode is a lot of fun, particularly when Ducat gets involved and his back and forth with Garrick is fantastic. The episode aired shortly before Voyager began airing, and it's a perfect episode for the time, contrasting the dangerous Cardassian space station against the cushy Starfleet flagship. That's a good point. Um... (laughs) I, I think DS9 always does well when it, when it reminds you of what the setting of the show actually is. Thank you, patrons, very much for your thoughts. We'll go to our final thoughts now. Brad, on our 1 to 5 scale, what are you going to give Civil Defense? Uh, you know, I struggle with this because <clears throat> my affinity for the episode is pretty strong. I, I, I love it, but I think I love it for all the wrong reasons. Uh, I don't think that it's, if, from a critical standpoint, I don't think that it's a amazing episode in terms of how it was put together but it's also better than it's also better than average so i'm gonna i'm gonna give it a four but that's a pretty inflated score it probably deserves like a 3.9 i'm gonna round it up to a four sure sounds good i'll give it a three i think i was my, my dividing line is always whether or not i'd show this to someone and i think it's just on the cusp of uh not being one that i'd recommend to show to somebody so sure I'll give it a three. I do enjoy it. I think that it's it's delightfully cheesy without being ruinous to the whole tone of everything. Um, I love the concept of it. I just, I I don't know. There's something there's something that just doesn't sit right with me. I think it feel it feels a little bit empty on some level, even though I love what it actually represents. Uh, let's see here. I think that's it, uh, guys. Thank you very much for supporting the show. Listening. All the social media links will be in the description. You can go to patreon.com slash the Penske file if you want to support the show. You can go to Discord, which is always fun. Uh, a lot of people are there now sort of talking about these things. It's a nice little place to chat. If you use Discord, you can go to our channel. I think they call it channels. And then, uh, let's see. I think that's pretty much it. So, we will call it a day there. Brad, thank you very much for coming on and sharing your thoughts about civil defense. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and we'll be back with the episode called Meridian after this, so we should be excited to talk about that one. Um, Oh, boy. Yeah, we've got another Dax episode. Uh, That's about it. Guys, thank you very, very much for listening, and we will see you next time.